Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, here uh, today for the teaching that uh, heaven has given through Science Rose today. And uh, we're looking for the voice of the Ruach HaKodesh to speak and speak only. Uh, let her jaws and her mouth and her lips be a vessel that you have created, Lord, to speak at this time. And so let her heart be connected to heaven and her mouth connected to our ears. And let that be the only connection that we're uh, to hear today. So speak, speak, Holy Spirit, that we might hear what you want for us at this particular time. And this is a self-same hour. So we're not to take any thought or what we're to say or to speak, but in the self-same hour, you said you would give us what we are to say and to speak. So we rely on you and listen for your voice now in the glorious name of Yeshua. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> this Torah portion is called Titzaveh, and it means you shall command. Uh, before I go into the service, uh, I want to say something that when God says you shall command, Titzaveh, he's not suggesting something, he's commanding something. And so uh, just to bring it home to most of us who are listening from this country, with all that's gone on, uh, we have this person who sits in the White House, supposedly running the government. His name is Biden. And so many of our people are saying, how in the world and what did we do to deserve Biden sitting in that seat? Well, I want to say that Yeshua himself is Biden his time. He's Biden his time in the sense that he's waiting for his people, his ecclesia, his bride, his called out assembly to bring forth and to obey his truth, his pure Torah, his Bereshit to the apocalyptic book of Revelation without mixture, without a babble type of speech, without speaking sound bites, without taking a scripture out of context, which is what you hear in most sermonettes. And only to the degree that anybody stands behind a bima and is able to didactically speak for God himself, they must start at the beginning. You cannot start in Matthew and understand the mind of God if you don't start in Genesis. That's not to say that somebody cannot be ransomed by the potentate blood of the lamb and know him as Messiah and Lord, but it does mean that you will not know the intention and the Hebraic mind of God concerning all scripture. So to the degree, the ecclesia, the blood-bought, washed bride of the lamb walks in his word, we would not have to have Yehovah himself biding his time with having this quote, Biden sit in that seat. So I want to start with that. I also want to explain if it's your first time listening to a Midrash on Shabbat, that the Torah, yes, it is known as the law, but it, it, more importantly, it is the perfect righteousness, truth, instruction of God himself. The Torah itself looks backwards and forwards in time. It has many layers of application to every generation. Uh, <laughs> when Yeshua was asked in John 17, Maze, maze emet, what is truth? He said, thy Torah is truth. He's saying that the written word and he himself are echad. They are one substance. To hear the Messiah, you're listening to the written word. Then you might say, well, wait a second. Wait a second, Zion's Rose. I've heard many sermons and they say that the letter uh, of the law kills and that I now have the spirit of God. Well, the reason that the scripture, what Rabbi Paul was saying was that the letter of the law kills, meaning if you offend in one point of the eternal Torah, you have transgressed the entire Torah. In other words, one point of offense, you've now transgressed the perfect truth and law of the living God. So the life of the spirit, the spirit of God speaks and will always point 
the spirit will always point because they are our echad. The spirit and the written word are echad. In the messianic kingdom, which is at hand, the messianic kingdom, we are so close to that, is the exact heavenly pattern. And I want to start with the half Torah portion. The portions of scripture that, are, that by God's grace, I'm going to synergistically piece together as a tapestry is the Torah, the half Torah, the writings, the prophets, and the renewed covenant as one scroll. But instead of starting with the Torah in Exodus 28, I'm going to start with the half Torah, which is the book of Yeshikel, which is Ezekiel 43. So for those of you who have the scriptures at hand, please go to the prophet Ezekiel. Most people don't like to teach on Ezekiel. If they do, they'll just talk about Ezekiel 37, the two sticks becoming one, in which Yeshua said in Matthew, I came not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The lost sheep are the 10 tribes in the diaspora. They've been in exile 20 over 20 700 years they must be united with judah their brother so most people have a elementary understanding of ezekiel through chapter 37 but all of ezekiel now it's very very interesting because not only was ezekiel shown joseph and judah becoming one house which is what yeshua came to do but also in this half Torah portion, this is very interesting. It starts in 43, verse 10. This is Jehovah speaking. He says, now thou, son of man, Ben Adam. Uh, Ezekiel was always addressed as son of man. Isn't that interesting? Show the temple to the house of Israel. Now, you might say, well, I am the temple of God. I am the temple of God, that I am the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Of course, that's true. The ecclesia is the temple of the living God. But that does not uh, negate the fact that the physical fourth rebuilt temple that Yeshua will rebuild himself is very, very preeminent in his mind. And so the sacrifices will be given as a memorial. The Zadok priesthood will minister. And it goes with this scripture, show the temple to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them take note of all the requirements of the pattern. The pattern, the heavenly pattern must be walked out now as it was back then. In, in Exodus 28, which I'm going to get to the Torah portion, but it's going to be the eternal heavenly pattern when Yeshua takes root and takes seat on the Davidic throne. That government shall know no end. And so Yeshikel Ezekiel was shown the millennial temple in which that fourth rebuilt temple that Yeshua will build himself. He's now saying to the house of Israel, pay attention. Let them take note of all the acquirements. If they be ashamed of all they have done, show them the pattern of the temple and the fashion thereof and the goings out thereof and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof all the ordinances thereof and then he says it again and all the forms thereof how interesting he repeats himself and all the laws thereof write it in their sight that they may keep the entire form thereof and all the ordinances thereof to do them this is the torah of the temple upon the top of the mountain the temple the whole limit thereof roundabout will be kodesh most holy because behold this is the torah of the house okay this is a millennial statement why do we diminish what's going to be in the millennium why do we not perceive that we as the ecclesia we are to make that heavenly pattern statement now as his bride as it shall be eternally and so the zadok priesthood they are the ones of the levitical tribe from aaron when moses saw the golden calf on the mount and he said who is on the lord's side it was the levitical 
priesthood of Zadok that went with Moses. And while God made an absolute stark raving scene of the 3,000 that perished, he's always making a distinction between the, the, the righteous priesthood and the corrupt priesthood, the obedient bride, the disobedient bride. And we see this going back here in Exodus 28. This is the Torah portion, and thou shalt command in the first verse in chapter 28, and take unto you Aaron and your brother and your sons with him from among all the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, all of Aaron's sons. You shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. So this Aaronic priesthood is from generation to generation. In Hebrew, it's called Dor Vador. And that is speaking. Now, I, we're going to get to something very deep. This is going to be a very, very profound Torah portion. I'm going to, the Ruach is going to go all over. But you need to understand that this promise from generation to generation was specifically meaning the Aaronic priesthood would always minister when the tabernacle when the temple stood it was an inherited priesthood the priesthood of the levites they would do all the, the bloodletting the vicarious animal that you would bring to the priest at the door that you could not as a citizen of israel no way no how uh, do it yourself you had to go through the mediation of the priesthood and they would inspect the lambs for the pesach offering and all the sacrifices and so god uh, spoke to Moses and he said, instruct the house of Israel. He also said that they needed to bring pure olive oil daily, once a day from the PM to the AM. Uh, and it had to be from the pure olive tree. Now the olive tree always throughout scripture, first law of mention, the olive tree always represents all of Israel. And we're going to see in, in the renewed covenant with Rabbi Paul, what he has to say about those natural branches and those engrafted in branches. But it was the instruction to command them, all of Israel, the olive tree, to bring the olive to crush them. They must go through a process. If this process is for purification, because the olive oil had to be pure before it could be used. And so it, it <laughs> could not be from a wild olive tree. It had to be from a pure olive tree. How interesting is that? So how, how much we get things subverted upside down. But the olive tree, interesting enough, is a resilient tree. It's a tree that even if it's not watered, it can smell the water way down the grove. If it has some scent of a water, the olive tree can literally live and it can survive. Can you imagine a tree smelling? Well, that's an interesting thought. But do you also know that we're trees? We are, we are called to be trees of righteousness, just like the olive tree represents the Jew, their cactus plants, they're resilient. They, they have so much persecution, but they have to survive. God says, if you can change the ordinances of the morning and the evening and the sun and the moon and the night and the day, then there won't be no more Jews left. But guess what? There's a lot of Jews left because none of these ordinances can ever change. And so as we're speaking, so it has to be with us. Now, here we go, looking backwards and forwards in time. There we go again with the Torah. It always has application in every generation. Well, for most of us who understand that we're probably in the terminal generation, we're probably in the final generation, how much more does this application apply to us? If we are not a pure olive tree, if we have not uh, walked through a lot of adversity, which uh, those of us who are the bride, we're going to have some tribulation. I mean, you know, Yeshua himself said, you know, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Could be you have more tribulation because you have a higher call. So more devils are after you. I really don't know. But it, it, oh, it makes spiritual logic that that would be the case. The closer you get to walking the fine line, holding the line, holding the truth, the more you're going to deal with the spiritual universe at large in the cosmic war that we live in. So let us go to uh, the renewed covenant of Romans 
11, of course. And here, here's our, our glorious epistle writer, Rabbi Paul. We call Apostle Paul. And he stops his discourse after he says, who in the world can separate us from the love of God? It's not possible. No devil, no angel, no life, no principality, no power, no anything that's present or anything behind us or anything to come, no height, no depth, nothing. No other creature, no other entity can separate us from the amazing love, which is in Yeshua, the eternal God. And then he starts right away, how interesting, in the calling and the election of Israel. And he says, just because somebody's born a Jew of the 12 tribes, he says, no, that doesn't make them a true Jew in the sight of the living God. A true Jew is what? One that is circumcised in their heart to love God and has no fear of man. And that uh, is filled with the praise. It's a, one of those who has the yada'in, their hands raised and gives praise to the living God through their life. And then he goes into, of course, the, the dissertation of Pharaoh. And he goes into uh, who's a true Jew and how our Jewish people, that they are ignorant of God's righteousness, trying to make their own righteousness, just like the Gentiles. Everybody wants to go in their own door instead of the door of Messiah, instead of him uh, recognizing that there is nothing good. There's no righteousness in any of us. Then he says for Messiah, and this is King Jameis, forgive the King Jameis bias, but it says for Messiah is the end of the Torah for righteousness to everyone that believes. The end is not, can't be possible. That makes all the scripture fully incorrect congruent if you think that he's the end of the Torah it means the perfected goal the Greek word is telos he is the perfected goal of the Torah for righteousness he is the goal of everything the Torah ever said about him and then you go into the 10 and 11 and of course you go into the the, the election of Israel if the casting away of of the Jewish people is the reconciliation of the whole world. What in the world is it going to look like when they finally receive the Lord, it's resurrection life from the dead. And now we're going to talk about the branches on the olive tree. And he totally goes into the, the natural branches. And he says, if some of the branches talking about the Jewish people were broken off, and you are just a wild olive tree and you have been grafted in amongst them and you are with them of equal value, partakers of the root and the anointing that comes from the olive tree, the covenants, the covenants belong to Israel. He is saying, Rabbi Paul is saying that to 99% of you do not boast against these natural branches because if you are boasting against them, they are are holding you up. You do not bear the root, but the root bears you. Who is the root? Yeshua is the root, and the nation of Israel is the root. That has been a point of contention. People have asked for millennia, who is the root? Well, it's the nation of Israel, and it's also our Messiah. And then it goes on to say, but you're going to say then, oh, oh, thou precious one born of the nations. Well, the Jews were broken off that I might be grafted in. He says, well, wait a second, because of their unbelief and the stupor superimposed upon them. Yes, they were broken off. So you only stand by faith. Do not be high minded, but fear God for if God did not spare the natural branches. He's not going to spare you. So behold, the goodness and severity of almighty God on the Jews who fell, severity true, but toward you goodness, if, if, if you continue in his goodness, meaning you're rightly aligned with the Jewish people, that's what that means. Otherwise you will be cut off from your service to the living God. So this is a major, major admonition to those born among the nations. And then Rabbi Paul says, if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and you were grafted contrary, to nature into this amazing olive tree, how much more, how much more are these, these natural Jews are going to be grafted into their own olive tree. They are the possessors of the covenants. They are the nation of Israel. They're progenitor of all the nations. So then he says, so brethren born among the nations, you do not be ignorant of this unique mystery. Lest you think you're so smart in your own conceit that superimposed blindness, which is only in part, is happened into Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in and then all Israel will be saved for out of Zion 
the deliverer shall come and turn all ungodliness away from Jacob. So the Lord is speaking through Rabbi Paul and he's saying, do not be caught up in replacement theology. That, that totally destroys and annihilates anybody's thought that that the Gentiles have replaced the Jews or that the covenants are now with the church folks. No, the covenants are clearly as Romans 9, 10, and 11 with the house of Israel. And you have been grafted into that amazing olive tree that only pure olive, olive oil can be used. So we as the body, the ecclesia, the called out assembly from paganism, that's what ecclesia means. You are called out from every every vestige of paganism to be brought to the original root, to the original faith, which is the glory of Israel, the glory of Yeshua, who is the root. And so if you go back to the Torah portion, we're going to speak about the promise that uh, God has given to the Aaronic priesthood. And he clearly says that they are to make high priestly garments for the priest. They are called the Kavod Teferet, the glory and the beauty. Well, don't you think that we, as the Ecclesia, we are going to have a parallel to anything that's written? Because again, the Torah looks backwards, it looks forward, it has multiple layers of application. So our armor as the Ecclesia of the Bride of the Pesach Lamb is going to parallel the vestiges uh, and garments of the high priest. So we as the saints, what do we have? We have a helmet of salvation. We put on the breastplate. We have the sword of the spirit, the word of the Lord. We have the belt of truth, right? We have to put the helmet on our head. Well, guess what? Every high priest in Israel always foreshadowed. Hold on. Put on your seatbelt. Put on your hat because they all foreshadowed Yeshua and his bride as one. Yeshua and his bride shall be one in that day, in that day. But we're supposed to be now. We're not supposed to be of a dissimilar nature to our perfect Jewish groom. We are to look like him. We're to eat like him. We're to think like him. We're to walk. We're to have our halakha like him. We're not to look like we belong to another God. And so our armor is going to naturally parallel uh, uh, whatever the high priest wore. So think about cults. Uh, it, now, uh, I'm not specifically saying that the Roman Catholic Church itself is a cult. I'm not saying that. I, I'm only just saying that the Pope who tries to take the place of the mediator, who is Yeshua, how does he dress? He's got a mitre on his head. But what does the high priest who foreshadowed Yeshua, what does his mitre say? It says, Kadosh la Adonai, holiness unto the Lord. So every religion, every cult is going to completely mimic and almost look like truth and look like it's not a cult. But the fact of the matter is the, the, the Pope has incense. Did not the true high priest of Israel had incense? that he had to use to put the coals to represent the prayers of the saints. And so if you think about uh, the high priest breastplate, we could talk about the ephod. The ephod was put on the high priest to represent the 12 tribes, the stones of the 12 tribes, that he had to have them on his heart. He had to represent all the tribes before God. And this ephod was a weave of gold and blue and red and purple and white linen. Why? Because of what the colors represent. Gold always, whenever you have the law of first mention, you have to always look back. God is not going to change his heavenly pattern. If he says number one is referring to him, Adonai Echad, one is going to mean one. And our color red is going to represent redemption, crimson, blood, atonement, all of these things. And so gold always represents deity, just like the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. Blue represents heavenly. God is from the, the, the heavenly realm. The red, the crimson, you know, just like mocking our Messiah. What did they put on him? 
They put on him like a scarlet kind of a purple robe that hailed to the king of the Jews. Well, he really was, but they were saying it in a mocking way. And so purple is dominion and the kingship and the kingdom. So all of these colors in the tabernacle and the temple were foreshadowing Remember the heavenly pattern, deity, heaven, redemption, dominion, kingship. And so the high priest <clears throat> had to carry Kol Yisrael on his shoulders and the, with the authority of God and over his heart. Did you know that the 12 stones parallel what? Now, I don't want you to say anything because you're all on mute. <laughs> on answer. They parallel the, the new Jerusalem foundation stones because it's the heavenly pattern, because it's the Torah that has must be walked out in every generation. All of these layers. Isn't that beautiful? Don't you love that? The heavenly pattern. We as the bride have to carry the heavenly pattern pattern and the high priest had what in the pocket of his ephod in that weave of those special colors representing redemption representing yeshua our ultimate high priest he had the urim and tumim urim is what the lights he said he is the light of the world he is the light in the menorah in the tabernacle in the temple he's the only light but there was no other light in the tabernacle or the temple because he, it had to foreshadow him in his heavenly temple. It, the the Urim and Tumim represent the oracle. What is an oracle? It represents they, they needed direction. They needed answers. It's mysterious. It's very mysterious, these lights and perfections. But obviously, the lights and perfections are who Yeshua is. Think about it. He's, he's lights. And perfections, he's plural of that. It's so wonderful. And so his mitre that he had on his head, that the helmet of salvation, which guards our heart, it's Kadosh Adonai, holy is the Lord. And even today, we have our Jewish people, they have the men wear coverings. Why? They are acknowledging that there's a higher authority. Jewish women who are married, they have these big bouffants and their hair goes all over the place and this, their heads like that, because why? They have a covering and a husband. How much more do we? Now, many precious women, they take Corinthians 7 very seriously and we should take all uh, scripture seriously and they their interpretation, and this is totally fine in the sight of the Lord, as they are wearing, uh, whether they're Jewish or not, they are wearing the head covering to speak again that they are under the covering of the Messiah. Now, this is a whole nother teaching and I can't go way off base here, but I will say that it's also related to being protected from the Nephilim. The head covering in particular, if you study it deeply, it's a reference, not just to having an earthly husband, not and having heaven cover you as a female, but it's also saying Nephilim, Anakim, Raphaim, every dark spirit has no place in my spirit, my soul, my mind, and my body. So I am going to put a head covering on. And how much more in these last days do we need to do things like that to cover ourselves, to have our armor on, to, to apply the blood of the lamb to our mind, to our heart, to our soul, the blood, the potentate blood of God, to dress accordingly so that why we are protected from darkness that we have no idea remember there's rulers there's powers there's there's dominions of darkness remember it says and that in, in, in daniel it says revelation 20 it says and then i saw the thrones that were set so god himself yahovah himself has thrones that are set in judgment that are now and they are eternal. There are people that sit on thrones for judgment. But on the other hand, the kingdom of darkness has dark thrones and dark principalities and dark 
uh, uh, entities that are trying to, to, to creep into women's houses who are silly and who do not know the Torah. They do not know the word of the Lord. So they are led away into deception. Why is hell enlarging itself? Why, how can this be? Why isn't heaven enlarging itself more than hell? Because Satan is the father of lies and he is the great, great deceiver. And so if it were not so, not so, there would not be an enlargement of hell. So people and women are greatly, greatly deceived very, very quickly, which is why not just Jewish men wearing, wearing the head covering and women also with having a husband and God being their covering, but against all of these end time darknesses of the Nephilim. But also it's a commandment in the scripture, Deuteronomy 6, where it says, Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And in one breath, one fell swoop, loving God with all our heart, soul, our mind, and our strength. He has commanded the children of Israel to bind on their arm to tefillin and on their forehead, the phylacteries, the prayer boxes, and say the Shema and the sheen is on the outside of that. The sheen is the letter for the name of God. And so when they do the, the uh, tefillin around the arms, it says right there that they are to make it, um, uh, the word is a katsak. It's so strong that the they're wrapped so intensely that it's purple. It's beyond the color of blood. It's purple black. We are to strap ourselves with the word of God, the Torah of God, just like a physical demonstration many times represents an eternal spiritual reality. And so even though the scripture is silent, and we don't find anything uh, specifically about Yeshua wrapping himself with tefillin and phylactery. He was an Orthodox Jew. And so even though you don't see many uh, uh, portraits of this, as an Orthodox Jew, uh, I just would like to, to, to put that out to, re to consider that Yeshua also did this with all of his brethren. Because if he didn't, they would have found fault with him. Because this is the scripture in Deuteronomy 6, to bind, to bind the eternal Torah around us. And even in the same way, in the end times, think about this, in the end times on the hand and on the forehead, what does the instead of anti-Messiah ask us to do physically? To put a mark, he's going to put his mark to those who have fully rejected the gospel of the Messiah. The same way in Ezekiel 9. If you go back to Ezekiel 9, we were in the book earlier. It says that those who sigh at the abominations, the abominations that were uh, committed and for weeping for Tammuz, for the false God. Oh my gosh, what a terrible abomination that the people of God would weep. For, for all the, the sun gods and the Tammuz, all, all these false Osiris, all of these entities that have different names, the nations have different names for all of them. And so God told the men in linen to go with, with their tablets and mark the righteous who are sad over these abominations. Are we sad over all of this false worship of all of these multiple gods we have to hate what god says in abomination we have to hate whatever is a false god and so we read in revelation 7 if you will uh, for those of you who are flipping and have your scripture with me it says and after these things on and on god says after all these things so the different things that happen he saw he sees the angel he's ascending from the east from jerusalem having the katam the seal of the living god saying don't hurt anything until we have katam the servants of god in their foreheads the same thing that god said in ezekiel 9 there is a placement so what does the anti-messiah want what is the instead of the the, the 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 one that's the opposite of the true messiah he of course asked for what the same thing on the right hand on the forehead the underworld and the anti-messiah can never create so he will always mimic to the utmost whatever god has spoken 
And so if you think about this is very interesting because in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14 it's specifically talking about the 12 tribes, the whole house of Israel, 12 always represents from the beginning the government of God, that they have always had the call to witness to the nations. And then you have uh, after the, the uh, 12,000 from each tribe were sealed, you go to Revelation 14, and it says, I saw the lamb standing on Mount Zion. There was your 144,000 again. And where is the father's name written in their forehead? Right there. There's your forehead again, because they are the first fruits of God and of the lamb. And so Messiah is always, think, think about that, your hand and your forehead has always been to put the word of the Lord, the forehead is, is your mind, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and your strength. That means your thought process, right? We think about this. The underworld knows all the commandments. He's been around a lot. He's the original sinner, not Adam and Eve, right? So he knows why. And he knows for people who, who to keep the commandments and actually do them, there's just not earthly reward, there's heavenly reward. And the underworld knows why you're supposed to do it. If it wasn't a big why, he wouldn't mimic God in all of these ways. And so the high priest, the high priest, again, foreshadowing Yeshua, he offered the blood on the altar. He anointed all the vessels in the tabernacle in the temple. What's the purpose to remove iniquity from the tabernacle and from the temple? Uh, the, all the service, they had to do all that service, which was a removal of iniquity. Well, if you read 2 Peter 2, 9, we as the ecclesia, here is another application. It says that we are a royal priesthood and that we're a holy nation. That's totally Hebraic semantics. We are one with Israel, that we're called out of darkness. So, so even though we don't have a rebuilt temple and tabernacle now, and we have become the, 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 the house of the Lord, how do we do? What do we do as a priest of the Lord? We confess and we forsake. That means that we are delivered by the Torah, by the word of the eternal Torah, and by his spirit. Yeshua as the ultimate high priest. He is the sacrifice, and he's the eternal high priest. So that means he's the offering, and he is the offerer. And so then, then you, we have to understand now, remember, the promise, the promise of this Torah portion is that the Aaronic priesthood would always serve from generation to generation. But it didn't mean that the Aaronic priesthood would always be the high priest forever, just in the service of the tabernacle and the temple. Because why? Throughout the scripture, we see that Melchizedek comes forth in, in Genesis 14. We see that Abraham paid them tithes while Levi was still in his loins. And God says in Psalm 110, for you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Where things go grossly wrong is that Melchizedek is not a name. It's not a name. People think it's a name. No, it's the order. It's the order. It's the order of the eternal priesthood. And so if you go to how can we go from Judah to Melchizedek? Well, let's go to Hebrews 7. It says right here, Melchizedek. This king of Salem, who was priest of the Most High, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and Abraham gave the tenth part uh, to him, being interpreted. He's the king of righteousness, the king of peace. It goes on, and it's just speaking of the eternal order, how great he was that our patriarch Abraham gave him the tenth of all the spoils while Levi was still in his loins. And then it goes on, and it says, but wait a second. For he of whom these things, it says, for the, if therefore, listen, this is very good. This is the profound part of the Torah portion. So pay close attention. Listen carefully. If therefore perfection was by the Levitical priesthood, for under it, the people have received the Torah. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is now made of necessity a change in the Torah. Okay, this is very, very important. So what's that saying is that the, the, the priesthood from Aaron to Melchizedek, by virtue of that, there 
has to be a change in the Torah, meaning what? Meaning the written Torah has now become a living man. The living letters are, are, are the man, and it's really a total metamorphosis. And so if you take away the fact of the Hebraic nature of the Messiah, you really are going to have another Jesus. You're going to have another Messiah. You're not going to have Yeshua, which means Yah is my salvation. Because the Torah and Yah is the ketubah that belongs to the bride. And so what, what happens, now see, uh, Revelation 12 clearly ends and this is the end of days. And it talks about the dragon that's wrought with the woman. He says he makes war with her and her seed. Now, the woman is obviously Israel, Zion. And it says he makes war with her and her seed who keep the commandments of Almighty God. And they have the testimony of Yeshua. So clearly, believing in Yeshua, Yah is my salvation, and having his commandments in this passage is actually one in the same. Now this is now this is Purim season. So in a few days we've got Purim. A lot of a lot of believers out of the ecclesia they find no relevance to Purim. It's just some kind of party and you eat some delicacies and and it's something about the Jews and something about a man that hated the Jews. But it's much deeper than that because in Purim God clearly said when they came out of exile, think, think about this. Judah came out 70 years. They were in captivity from Babylon. They came home. But 2,700 years, the exiles are still coming home. They're in the diaspora, the 10 tribes. But it says clearly right there, God says to Judah, go home. Do not stay in Persia. You don't belong there. But they were disobedient. If it wasn't for one woman to rise up, and bring deliverance to the house of Israel, they would have all been destroyed. Uh, because God says, if you don't, if you don't rise up, O woman of God, He says, everybody in this kingdom will will perish, but God will raise up a deliverer to keep at least one Jew in the earth. And so the same way the Jewish people have to let go of all rabbinicism, Gentiles have to let go of all their traditions if they are not sanctioned by the scripture. And that's the point of Purim. So it's not just to believe in Jesus. Yes, you can believe in the Messiah. Yes, you're saved by faith. But remember that to sanctify the name is to love his word, to keep his word in all of these areas. And so Yeshua, the last prophet in Israel, when he was mikvah, when he was baptized by John the Baptist as the last prophet, the transfer of the Aaronic, remember, John the Baptist was Aaronic, right? He transferred the authority to Yeshua of Melchizedek during the mikvah, during the baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He had the supreme authority to do that. And so this Melchizedekian priesthood was inaugurated at the resurrection. He took his seat as the offerer, as the high priest, as the one who put his own blood on the mercy seat. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to almighty God in, through, and by him. So all physical things are shadows of deep, eternal, uh, spiritual reality. Every historical account in the scripture <clears throat> speaks to then, but it all speaks to the future and eternity. Now, you're probably going to be a little shocked at this, <coughs> but Yeshua taking the Melchizedekian priesthood. <clears throat> Remember it, the historical account? Back to Genesis 43, it was established. <clears throat> For those of you who know the story of Joseph, way back, so you have to go back to the beginning. What happened? In that story, Judah is presenting himself before his brother Joseph but he doesn't know it. <clears throat> Remember the goblet was discovered in Benjamin's bag. So Judah 
interceded for his younger brother, Benjamin. Now I'm, I'm taking you how Yeshua has the Melchizedek, Melchizedekian priesthood. It started right back here. Now listen carefully. He became insurance for his brother, Benjamin. And this is his words. This is Judah. I shall bear the blame to my father forever. I will be a slave. When Judah made that verbal confession, he was the insurance. He, that was a binding oath. In Hebrew, it's the word halakha. You can't change halakha. That's a full eternal authority statement. The same thing when you go to Matthew 16, where Yeshua says to Kepha, I give you the keys to bind and to loose in his kingdom. He was not speaking of binding Satan. Revelation 20, Satan will be bound. That's a halakha expression, meaning what? Meaning to the coca king, to the disciples, apostles, I give you the authority to bind what is written in the Torah to bring it forth into the new covenant. So that it's one scroll. Take out every mixture, take out everything that's rabbinical, and take that which is written by the finger of God and bring it into the new covenant so that when my people, Jew or Gentile, read it, they are reading the purity, the original root faith. And so because Judah put himself in a binding oath in the place as intercessor, he took Benjamin's place what a mis mystery that means listen carefully hear what i'm saying do not hear what i'm not saying that's saying that judah would be the bearer of melchizedek forever that is why it, ezekiel 37 the two sticks of joseph and judah have to be fully married and aligned they represent the entire house of israel that's what yeshua meant in matthew 10 i did not come but for what the lost sheep of the house of israel the lost sheep are all those tribes in the diaspora that must be joined to their brother judah and when judah made that confession that binding halakha expression it says at that moment joseph representing Yeshua, the suffering Yosef, it says he could not contain himself any further. And it says it was then that he revealed himself and he said, Ani Achi Yosef, I am your brother Yosef. That's the same thing he's going to say when he takes his circuitous returned to the Mount of Olives when he goes through first the mountains of Edom, and he slays by the breath of his mouth and his sword, it says that what? He's going to end up, his feet are going to land on the Mount of Olives, the same place that he left in Acts 1, 11. And according to the prophet Zechariah 12, 10, they will look upon the olive Tav Yosef, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And how interesting that Judah is the fourth tribe. But it says right there in Zechariah 12, it says that Judah, the house of David, will mourn first because of their supreme responsibility as the tribe that carries the scepter and as the tribe who became the intercessor, which is the reason why after Joseph, after Judah makes this halakhic binding oath that when Jacob gives the binding blessing in Gen Genesis 49 to the 12 tribes, when he comes to where? Now, remember, these are binding. To this day, the 12 tribes are living out these express blessings. He's speaking to Judah. He says, Judah, you are a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up, you stooped down, you crouched as a lion, as a lioness, who is going to rise and rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor one who gives the Torah from between his feet until Shiloh come. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. This, of course, is speaking of 
Yeshua of Judah, but it's also talking about the scepter being a Torah, uh, a Torah giver because Yehuda, Judah possesses the kingship. That's how David had to come out of Judah. That's how the throne of David is the everlasting government. That's how uh, the ultimately Melchizedek, who is the king of righteousness, how he will reign because it says out of Judah, what? It says that the Torah speaks nothing of, but it's clearly Judah who said, I will take the blame. I will intercede Judah of Yeshua. And so what does this mean? This means that you are the bride of the Kohen Gadol. You are the bride of the high priest Yeshua, that you have a scroll of destiny from the beginning of creation. And as you were created as an eternal spirit, that means that in the mind of God, eternally you've been. What a mystery is that? <clears throat> and how could that be? Because I'll tell you why. Because in, in Peter, it says what? That the lamb was slain before <laughs> the worlds began. That's why. He was slain in the mind of God before the original sinner, before the sin of Adam and Eve, who for the joy set before him. We're talking about eternity past. Just like the Torah in Exodus 19, 19, it says it was given at Sinai the Torah being the word, but the word of God has no beginning. It just means it was given to man in Exodus 19 at Mount Sinai. So the spirit of God that has, uh, that um, you are sealed with, you are possessed of, is all truth. And all truth, the spirit will lead you into all truth from the beginning. And so if you think about the sin, <laughs> when Adam and Eve and, and the eating of the fruit, if you go back to the beginning with the first woman, when this happened, uh, the Almighty pronounces judgment on the anti-Messiah, the serpent, Satan himself. He first does that. He first pronounces the judgment for coming before Adam and Eve in his deception. And then he speaks to Eve and he says what? you will have pain in childbearing. So that's not good. Every woman does not have a good time having a baby. Then it says that uh, in the King Jameis, and, and I say King Jameis because King Jameis is an English translation. That's your job to make sure that you uh, study and see what the mind of God in the uh, eternal language has to say on a matter. In the King Jameis, it says, your desire will be for your husband. But that's not what it says in the eternal Hebrew. It says, your desire, Eve, will be of his substance. Why? Because she came out of Adam. Just like when Yeshua said, Kala, it is finished, what happened? The bride came out from the riven side of Yeshua. And as I shared in another Torah portion, that Adam was given his bride, but Yeshua paid full price for his bride. So where does that leave us as the bride in the ecclesia? It leads us this way, that we as the bride, we are called. Now we can't go back and get it right. Once we're in the grave and once it's over and once we, you know, uh, go to, to glory, uh, it is what it is. Whatever we understood, whatever we studied, <clears throat> Whatever we obeyed, whatever we diso disobeyed, the fire is going to burn it all up. On that judgment day, no, you're not going to be condemned. If we just have a big bonfire, simple as that. Did whatever you didn't get right, whatever you disobeyed, however you never paid attention to the Ruach, leading you into all truth and you went the wrong way. Well, it is what it is. We have to, we have to live in reality. We have to live in reality. We live in a culture of people who do not live in any form of reality with right and wrong, profane, holy, righteousness, unrighteousness. These are not thoughts in the average person, but in the bride of the Kohen Gadol of the high priest, which is us, we have to live in reality, in thought, action, obedience. We are to reflect this Yeshua, we don't make a Jesus of our own image. We, the cults do that. Listen, 
The cults all believe in God. Everybody will say, I believe in God. The devil believes in God. All of hell believes in God. There is no repentance and there's no obedience and there's no submission and there's no yieldedness to that. But the destiny of the bride. Now think about this. You have a name. Your name reflects who you are and what you're called to do in the earth. You have a destiny. That means that Yeshua's, Yah is my salvation, the name given by the Father to the Son. That means that Yeshua's abominations, they have become mine. I view them at whatever he says in abomination. That, that's, I agree with that. His holiness needs to become mine. Whatever his view, according to the eternal scripture in the finger, the etzba Yehovah, the finger of God, whatever he says is holy. I, I definitely, I'm going to agree with that because if I don't, I am uh, thinking I am living in a mirage. I am living in denial. I am not being a bride of the Kohen Gadol. And so you say, well, what about all my mistakes? What about all my sins? What about all my uh, disobedience? Well, like I just said, we have a big bonfire, but remember all of that it, that's not in your scroll of destiny in, in, in the sense that uh, it, it, this is within the perimeter of Jehovah's permissive will. He is going to allow the fate of sinning against him to have an end to it. It has to have an end to it. Whatsoever a man or woman sows, they must reap. Now, is that in the eternal realm? Or is that down here? Well, I submit to you that's down here. Whatever a man sows or woman sows, they're going to reap. If we sow to unrighteousness and sow to the flesh, that's what Rabbi Paul said all throughout the epistles, we have to reap whatever the flesh is. Uh, uh, and the flesh is so disobedient to God. The flesh never wants to obey God. It's selfish. It's depraved. And it has a mind of its own. And so this reaping, this sowing and this reaping is part of the amazing, staggering, shocking free will of God. I mean, come on now. Uh, he's really going to allow you, unless he intervenes, he's going to allow you to make your own mess. And it ain't going to be pretty because you're going to have to reap that mess in this day and age. And, and it's true. And listen, if he in celestial Shekinah glory allowed Hasatan to sin against him, how much more we who are born from the, from the dust and the orb of the dirt of the ground, born into sin. No, we're not. No, we're not inherently righteous and good. No, no, we're no good. We're inherently sinners like our mother and father, Adam and Eve. So if he allowed the original sinner, how much more is he going to allow you and I to decide we, we want to follow the Lord and his word or we really don't care? And so God, see, that's why it's so wonderful. It's so glorious when he says, let every man be found a liar and let Jehovah be true. Only he is true. We, we are liars. We deceive ourselves. We think we're okay. We think we're holier than we are. We're not. We're not. If there's any goodness in us ever to do anything good, it's totally the fruit of the spirit of God that's called goodness. Everything else is a farce. All these philanthropists and these good Roman Catholics that do all these good deeds. No, 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 no. That's done according to the flesh. That's dung. That's a menstrual cloth. It's vile. It's no good. It's cast out. So if you do something good and the more you realize that, that, that when you mourn for your sin, when you mourn for lack of being obedient, this is very good. Because God says he's going to comfort you. He says you're going to inherit the earth. All of these good things. And then if you can imagine this. If you can imagine this. God finally. Think about this. 
the, the messianic kingdom where the Torah goes forth, the eternal counsel of God goes forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem when Yeshua sits on that throne and all those sheep nations that survived the tribulation and the bride of the lamb with her seat seat and all the nations taking that seat seat saying, we're going to grab that seat seat and go with you for God is with you. All that's going on. But guess what? That has an end. Because we have to have a parenthetical time frame of 75 days. Oh, my goodness. Before the renovation of the whole blasted earth and everything that wasn't perfect before the Kaddish Yerushalayim, before the New Jerusalem comes down. And are you ready for this? This is the finale for God to prove he is so true and man is so depraved is that even in those thousand years when Satan and the whole host of heaven is bound up and he's not allowed to deceive, he's not allowed to do anything. When Yeshua is sitting on the throne, it says what? It's amazing. Revelation 20. And when the thousand years are finally expired, Hasatan is going to be released and loosed out of his prison. And he is going to go forth to deceive the, the surviving nations in the millennial kingdom, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog, Magog. He's going to gather all of them together. Are you ready? For the number of them is as the sand of the sea. It says, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and they compassed the camp of the saints round about and the beloved city Yerushalayim. But instantly fire came down from Yehovah, came out of heaven and devoured them instantly because God is true. Even man is a liar, even in the millennial kingdom. There is an element of mankind that is not going to uh, uh, stay and, 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 and with all the glory of Yeshua on that throne, it says that God is going to come out and devour all of them. And then it says there right away at that point, and the devil that deceived, there's your deception, is now cast in the lake of fire where the sulfur, brimstone, the beast, the false prophet, and they are all tormented day and night forever and ever and then it speaks about the great white throne because the great white throne it says the books were open and another book was open what in the world the other book the other book is i submit you is the torah the eternal torah and counsel of the of the lord the dead small and great stand before god the books were open another book was open the book of life and the dead are judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. Well, guess what the works are? The works are either righteousness or unrighteousness because the Torah is perfect righteousness and that's what goes forth out of Zion forever. And then it just ends with whoever's not found in the book of life is cast in the lake of fire. So God in his supreme uh, free will opportunist God he gives all of us free will to love and to serve him but he must prove he must prove that man is inherently depraved even in the very end but you know what not so with us as the bride we no 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 we represent the Kohen Gadol we it says that when he God spoke to Kava Eve Kava he said your desire will be of his substance not, it's not a submission to the husband. She, she is saying, like Adam came out of her. Remember in the beginning, it says that Adam and, Adam and Eve were initially called Adam. She was called Adam. She didn't have a name initially. God was saying from the beginning that man and female, the imagery of a man and female, God is feminine, masculine. Elohim is masculine. Elo, Eloah is feminine. El is masculine. God has the feminine <clears throat> and the masculine side. That's why he had to take Eve out of Adam. That's why he had to take the Kala, the bride, out of Yahshua, so that we, as the ultimate high priest, we can represent him in thought, word, and deed as he is. And so it shall be in the kingdom. The bride shall be at the right side. It is written. <clears throat> and the nations 
Remember Matthew 25, it says that when you came to visit me and you fed me, you came to prison, he says, I will say to you, come blessed of my father into the eternal kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began because you took care of my Jewish people. But because you neglected them and you betrayed them, you are not my sheep. You are the goats. Go into the everlasting fire because to love the Jewish people is to love the quintessential Yeshua, the king of the Jews. And that is the scripture. And that is what has been written from the beginning. And that is the testimony. That is the halakha. No, the new covenant's no different than two thirds on the left. It's one book. Every narrative, every story speaks of eternity. They are foreshadows of Yeshua and his bride in his kingdom eternally. So this is our mission. And this is if we will choose to accept it and walk in it so that we will have something to put at the lamb's feet on that day, which is very, very close. Because this might be another shock, but the scripture does say that when the last Yehudi says, Baruch Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That he knows the last Jew that's going to say that. But he's not returning until that does happen. In his estimation, when that last ransomed Jew is that survived the tribulation, that stayed true to God, well, we can hasten his return. Or we can prolong his return as the bride. We can hasten or prolong. So I just submit to you in the name of Yeshua. Do you want to hasten his return? Then do what he says. Be the bride of the Kohen Gadol. Be that bride that loves and eats all of his word. Man does not live by anything, but by every word that proceeds from the very pay, from the mouth of the living God. That's uh, Deuteronomy 8, 4, and that's Matthew 4, 4. It's the same thing. Yeshua is always quoting the Tanakh to show you that he is the fulfillment of the Tanakh. He himself is the new covenant, and he is the entire scroll that we are called to eat. So, Father, in the name of Yeshua, I thank you at the sound of my voice that everyone who listens to me now or in the days to come that will stumble across this a teaching. Father, I pray that for the anointing of your spirit, that you draw all men unto you, you who is the living word, who is the word of truth, Lord, you would draw them unto you. They would know that they are ransomed by the blood of the potent take Passover lamb. And by being ransomed, they have become the bride of the ultimate high priest. And oh God, how you want her to be of the same similar nature as the bride, Lord. How much more so as an eternal holy God who's going to live forever, forever in the presence of you is in fullness of joy. Lord, we thank you for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We look forward to that, Lord. Make us a prepared people. In Yeshua's name, amen. In Yeshua's name, I thank and praise you for this time. Thank you for the fruit of it, Lord. To whoever's listening, whoever's going to listen, uh, save many people, grow them up. I pray that, Lord, uh, I thank you that you were represented accurately in your scripture today. Thank you for the opportunity of ministering on this holy eternal Shabbat. And may everyone uh, walk in the truth and greatly consider your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay. Amen. Everybody got, do you have a, I'm going to stand for whoever's got a shofar to seal it. Okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> Holy Amen. 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 As, as, as Yehudi said in Israel, it's one, one in the morning over there, but um, Shua, Shua Tov means have a great week. La Shua Tov. Have a great week in the Messiah. And uh, thank you to Ravonda for being our moderator, Amen. for helping everybody get on. Yes. yes. And happy Purim mm -hmm. this week. Happy Purim. We will be in South Carolina, for those who want to come to Perm, um, we're going to have a great gathering. Okay, thank you. Chew it out. Right. Bye. Chew it Bye. 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 Bye.
Thank you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.